it's just when you get into your 70s and like I am, you, you, you start looking back at life and you say, well, what does your life want to mean? And, and when it really comes down to it, I mean, it's not how much money that you've made in your life that counts mm -hmm. uh, in the end. It's how many people's lives you've improved. That's mm -hmm. really, you know, and um, it's not only good philosophy. I mean, it's a good Christian philosophy. That's what this country is built on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, it's a good way to live, I think. It gives you a lot of peace and a lot of satisfaction. Yes. So I said, I'm going to put all this knowledge into a course because online courses are really the thing nowadays mm -hmm. uh, for those that are willing to to, to, uh, to take the time to earn. And so I, I did. I did. It's got like seven hours worth of video and everything. It goes through all the different legal formats. It goes through all the mm -hmm. paperwork requirements, how you should keep your paperwork, how to put it together. Because the better you put your paperwork together, the better the people that you hire can do their job for you. Mm. And then it goes through all of the tax consequences of all the legal formats and how all these three things tie together to work together to help you build a solid foundation onto your business. Papaya! Hello all, welcome to another episode of Transform Your Future with me, Eddie Eisen, where I sit down with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and high achievers as they identify areas I can improve on and guide me to further my self-improvement practice. For more information and insights, join the newsletter at transformyourfuture.com, where I write about reinvention, personal growth, and identity. Today's guest is Roger Pearson. For over 50 years, Roger has created, sold, or managed many small businesses. But in 2001, he switched course and began, began working as a master tax advisor. In that time, he watched hundreds of small business owners lose thousands of dollars needlessly. Recently, he made it his mission to provide entrepreneurs the knowledge to build solid foundations under their business to keep more money in their pockets and give less to the government. That sounds really good, by the way. Welcome, Roger. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. So um, I've got some questions I know that I want, but I got to tell you the idea of less money going to Uncle Sam and more money going to my pocket. That is a very good idea. That's something that I would like to talk about for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, the thing about it, you know, being from a small business background most of my life, uh, when I got into doing taxes professionally for other people, I kind of specialized in small business because that was my thing. And uh, over time, I would watch people just, just paying so much in, in taxes they didn't have to pay because mm -hmm. they simply didn't have the education. And it's no wonder because, you know, there is basically no education in this country for, to learn as small business people. There's a few mm. of them sprouting up here and there, for, but for the most part, they're even. Uh, for several years, I, I taught tax classes, actually. I, I taught, uh, mm -hmm. taught taxes, and I would have college business majors come in and sit in my class, and they would come up to me afterwards, and they would say, you know, we ask our professors about this type of stuff, and they tell us we have to go find the answer someplace else. They didn't teach that in college. <laughs> And that just blew me away when I heard how yeah. can a business major in in college not be taught the structural values mm. of running a business? It makes no yes. sense. They get them ready for the corporate world, but not for the small business world. And there's yeah. two totally different things. Yeah. Although the basic principles, if you're going, if you're on a management track with a large company, the more you know about business structure. Uh, that the small business has to put up with, the more value are you are to your uh, employer and and the faster that you can advance through uh, to higher management levels, which mm. was what my experience was when I did those times, uh, uh, the decades that I did go in and work for other people. I knew what they were doing, what they were talking about, what they wanted and how it all worked. And I was able to uh, get into uh, higher management positions because of that. So, you know, it's it's an all around thing that you need to know 
all about the legal structures of business. You need to know how to handle the paperwork of business, which is what everybody hates. And you have to know what the tax consequences of every decision you're going to make in your business, or you're going to throw away lots of money you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know that some of uh, my audience, uh, I, I work in sales and sales strategy. I, I work with you know, businesses to create sales strategies and bring a sales team in. Uh, and I also work a lot training and, uh, you know, motivating sales teams and individuals, especially commission only salespeople and small business entrepreneurs and such. And I know one thing that uh, there's an area that is, is a little tricky, I guess. And that's there are commission only salespeople who work in a W2 environment where they're not getting 1099. And so they have to get a little bit creative of how they can write things off. And I know that's a major area that uh, I think there's some confusion in. Are you familiar with that? Well, kind yeah, of a- I mean, that, that basically changed in 2018 when the current tax laws went into effect. Prior to that, uh, you could take all of your business expenses, uh, your W-2 business expenses that your employer did not reimburse you for. Right. And you could write them off um, on a Schedule A itemized deductions if you mm-hmm. used itemized deductions. And, mm-hmm. and at that time, um, the uh, standard deduction was so low that that was fairly easy to do. I mm-hmm. had uh, so many clients just go into shock and 2018 came around and I had to tell them, no, you can't deduct any of that anymore. Exactly. I said, you need to go back to your employer and renegotiate um, that uh, to see – okay, you either need to make more money or more commission, or you need to set up something where you can be reimbursed for part of your your uh, sales expenses that you're doing sure. out on the road, that that company is getting free gratis at the moment, you know? So, uh, and that was the only really way to stop it because tax-wise, because of what Congress did in lowering the tax rates, they had to cut someplace, and that's one of the places they cut. You know, Mm -hmm. they tried to cut the things that the least number of people in the country use. And unfortunately, uh, uh, expenses for salespeople was one of those things. Mm. Yeah. And and navigating that is is a little bit um, difficult. And and, uh, I know, like, we need to be educated about these things and, you know, how to handle it, what we can write off, what we can't, you know, those kinds of things and track those things so that you have justification at the end when you put it in the paperwork. Um, but one way that we've tried to handle this is uh, having a, a, a business, a corporation and and working and then just putting all the income together and then taking the write offs out of it that way rather than just doing a w-2 income and not have a business does that does that make sense is that something that, that you could do is that, is that yeah. ethical well <laughs> that that's that's there's the rub it's the yeah it's right there <laughs> on the line you know you have to be very very careful with that because yeah. uh, the irs can come in and they can recharacterize income most people mm-hmm. do not know this um mm. uh for instance <clears throat> If, if if somebody is treating you as an independent is is as an as an employee as a W two mm-hmm. employee where they're mm-hmm. telling you what to go when to go how to do it the whole thing just as if you but they're trying to pay you as an independent contractor on a ten ninety nine they are asking to go into that business and recharacterize all those people as W two employees and hand you a nice bill for back taxes and, and mm. penalties and fees and everything else. Uh, so you have to be real careful with things like that. At some point, uh, it may be better. The other thing that I would advi- I'd advise people mm-hmm. to do is mm-hmm. set up yourself a, a, a instead of a, running on a, a, a just a W-2 or a sole proprietor, set up like an S-Corp and uh, go to your employer and say, I want to be uh, – I want to be uh, paid as a 1099 employee instead of a W-2 employee. Now, there's goods and bads about that. As far as the tax part of it goes, uh, then you're allowed to write off all those expenses against your income. Mm-hmm. And it could be when you go into a negotiation like that uh, where I say, oh, I'd rather be paid this way than that way. Um, you're going to lose benefits and things like that generally. So you have to mm-hmm. weigh that into the factor, how much those benefits are worth. And most people have no idea how much their benefits are worth. Uh, mm-hmm. They just know what 
the net amount they get in their W-2 is. Mm. And so you have to weigh that again. And then there's other ways you can negotiate. Well, if you say, okay, I want to be uh, an independent, con- paid as an independent contractor, instead of W-2 now, could you pay me this much more an hour since you're not going to have to pay half my Social Security and Medicare and anything anymore? Mm. So there's a lot of ways to look at that and, and really to know whether it's something you should get together with a good uh, tax advisor, uh, preferably an enroll agent, and uh, sit down and run the numbers, several different scenarios, and find out be- before you even go in and talk to an employer about this type of thing, mm. uh, whether that would be a good fit for you or not. And it may not. It, it mm. depends on the amount of expenses. Some salespeople have huge amount of expenses, especially with the cost of gas nowadays. Yeah. Absolutely. What was that term you just used um, when you said get get a uh, tax advisor? You used a certain term about oh, an said, enrolled agent. Yeah. What does that uh, mean? Enrolled agent is like the PhD of the tax world. You know. Uh, <clears throat> now there's there's several different classifications uh, uh, that can practice that can represent somebody. Like a lawyer represents you in court. There yes. are certain people that can represent you with a limited power of attorney uh, with the IRS. So you don't even have to talk to the IRS. You know, mm. uh, you can give this person permission to do that. Uh, CPAs, by de- definition, can automatically represent whether they know anything about taxes oh. or not. Uh, lawyers can represent before the IRS. But an enrolled agent is somebody that is the only uh, classification of representation that you have to earn by knowing tax law. Mm. You have to ha- you have to actually pass three three hour IRS exams to become wow. an enrolled agent. You have to take twenty five hours worth of continuing education classes uh, on tax subs on tax subjects and ethics mm-hmm. every single year. And so uh, if you really want to know somebody that is versed in taxes, that's, that's the highest that you can get in the profession. And, and it was an enrolled, or an enrolled uh, agent is called an enrolled agent. Yeah. Right. So these, and, and that's, uh, that's above a CPA. Yeah. I mean, a CPA, a lot of people think that CPAs are experts in taxes and uh, some of them are. Some of them take tax classes every single year because they have to take continuing education also. Mm-hmm. The fact is that um, to get a CPA certification, you have to take some basic tax classes your first year to get your certification. After that, uh, I love that you changed things very recently. Uh, you never have to take another tax class the rest of the year. And I find that many CPA firms doing taxes on this is a, is a side job. It's extra income for them. That's mm. why they, they do so many extensions uh, for people and then just do them after tax season's over, you know, when they got some mm-hmm. extra time. And it's a shame. It's a really, really shame, you know. And, and some of the things that I teach people in working with them is, is how to uh, pick a good accountant or a good CPA if you want them doing your taxes also. Hmm. And, and, and I have other, I have clients also that they have a bookkeeper, uh, or CPA, uh, to do their accounting because that's mm-hmm. what they're good at. Mm-hmm. And then they have a separate tax advisor to do their taxes, uh, who they mm-hmm. take their P&Ls to. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things to take into consideration when you're picking somebody, you know, yeah. I, I let's people, talk, let, you know, let's talk about that. What is some good criteria for that? Well, the thing about it is. I hear so many, and, and I hear these these because I have to fix the problems that are created by these things, and and that's one thing I've I've learned over the years. Uh, I I tell somebody that if they're if they're whoever they're doing their taxes with, um, mm-hmm. and even their bookkeeping with, if they don't want to sit down and talk to you, uh, if they're one of these firms, just drop it off. I'll call you when it's done. Run, <laughs> run away, go away. That's if, if you care about your business and mm-hmm. your money, run away because they don't care, you know, if, mm-hmm. especially if you're a small business person. I mean, the number one thing you're looking at for anybody you bring on your team and you absolutely should bring on a tax advisor and a bookkeeper yeah. or accountant on your team uh, because you, you want to be out advancing your business, not taking care of something you can pay somebody a minimal right. amount to do, you know, right. and uh, but the things you 
You want somebody that cares about your business. You know, it's just when I take on a client, for instance, I mean, I know more about the trades than most trades, I think, because uh, I take on a painting business. I have to learn the painting business for me to give mm. that person good advice on on, on uh, how to handle his taxes and how to handle his accounting and everything else. I have to learn his business. I have to learn how he works, how he prefers to work, uh, how mm. he prefers to run his business. And then I can give him proper advice. But mm -hmm. you need to find somebody that's willing to sit down and talk to you about those things that ask those questions of you that allows right. you to ask questions of them. Mm -hmm. then you're going to have somebody that is proper to bring on your team. But if it's just this, oh, you're just another number type attitude you're getting from these people, run away, find somebody yeah. else because they're not, they're going to cost you money in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, um, a lot of individuals don't put a lot of thought into getting somebody to do their taxes. Um, They'll, you know, they'll, they'll say, Oh, well, my friend, he does taxes. He does my taxes and I love him. Why don't you just call my friend? And, you know, that's, that's as much education and research that they do to, to find somebody. So, so I think that's good, uh, having some criteria. And I, and I like, uh, I like your criteria of, you know, if they don't want to sit down and ask you questions to better understand your business and your situation, run like hell. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So how, what are the, uh, just, I know that this is a little bit kind of off topic, but what are the challenges when you have like, um, you have a, you have a corporation, uh, or an LLC f uh, for that matter. And really your main income source is coming from a W2 income source, but you know, you're buying equipment, you're, you have some services that you use, uh, you know, maybe you use a part of your house to, to run the business and put your equipment. Um, what are the kind of complications between that? Why is that a, why is that a difficult area to navigate? Well, the, the law simply states at this moment, we don't know what's going to happen. 2026 depends who gets it voted in this, this fall, mm. uh, because the current tax laws are slated to go through the year 2025 and then everything's on the table again. Uh, whether it gets turned upside down again, whether those deductions will come back again, uh, who knows? And uh, I, I can't even project what that may be. Yeah. But the fact is that uh, W-2 employees cannot, cannot deduct uh, the expenses that they incur creating their income, you know, other than to negotiate a, a reimbursement from their employers. Uh, now, if you have a W-2 uh, employee if you have a side business that's a different matter yeah um, your side business can be income you know you could do uh if you have a side business going it's got to be proven to be profit that you're intending to create a profit that is just mm -hmm. not there to, to to get out around the tax laws right the irs is asking a lot more questions than they used to they're mm. not using all that new money they just got to go after four hundred thousand dollar enough people uh, the mm. number of IRS letters that I've gotten this last year just on uh, solo proprietors is amazing, uh, showing mm. them to prove that they actually have the deductions. Really? Claiming. It's, uh, yes, it's vastly improved. It's two or three times what it was just a previous year ago. As wow. One of so uh, don't believe everything that you read in the media because mm -hmm. uh, there's more things happening at the IRS than they're talking about. Mm. So you have to be careful. You really have to be careful of that. So, I mean, the only the only way that you can deduct things, uh, uh, you know, is is if you're uh, in business for yourself, basically, and you can mm -hmm. deduct it against 1099 income, you know, or yeah. just cash business. However, you you make your business, then you can take home office. These sole proprietors can take home office deduction. Corporations cannot. S corporations cannot. Partnerships cannot. Only S corporations that are not have not become an LLC. Because mm. you're, once you're an LLC, then uh, you're, you know, that's a different classification of business. So that's that's even you have to be very very careful about that also. Mm. So they, they haven't so, really so just that, you, just, they haven't really left you a lot of options as as, yeah. as the salespeople in this country currently. Yeah, it's terrible, uh, and the, you know you got to figure out some creative way to handle this as an individual. Because when you think about it, I mean, okay, if if you're just you know, the, the average uh, commission only salesperson 
probably make $60,000 a year, $75,000 a year. But anybody who's working at a high level, we're talking about making 150 to, you know, $300,000 a year of, uh, you know, commissions. And when you, when you're in that level, if you don't have a way to handle that, I mean, we're talking about a, a lot of money that the IRS would expect, uh, you know, from that income. So, um, getting creative has been, I know, something that I've worked on in my life to do stuff, but it's getting harder and harder, like you said, since 2018, uh, how things are working. Um, but I, I'm just fascinated. You know so much information about this. Most people, even the people I talk to who do taxes, don't have that much information about things. Uh, you know, I've learned more in the last five minutes with you than I have from some of these other people. I mean, uh, there's other avenues you can and uh, could do. For instance, you could take if you're making one hundred sixty thousand dollars a year, you want to shelter part of that. You know, you want to to, to do things. You can you could buy some rental real estate. You know, become a landlord, mm -hmm. and you're going to end up with depreciation, all kinds of other deductions that you can deal with there, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. if you manage it yourself, if you if mm -hmm. can't take losses, if you have somebody else manage, but if you manage it yourself, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can take up to $25,000 worth a year at losses. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's, yeah, and then they, there's some other structures like 401ks and things like that. Exactly. That you could move money into so that, you know, you don't right. have any tax liability and maybe in the future, your tax liability be less, which, Whenever they say that, I always feel like that sounds like a terrible plan. Like, shouldn't I be making more money <laughs> when when, uh, when I'm older? Why should I make less money? But I, I know what the justification is. Uh, it's just a funny thing to me. But when you were talking just now, you mentioned about only certain types of uh, business entities can actually even take certain deductions. What was it you said about, like, personal deduction of, like, space you use in your home or things oh, like that? Oh, the home that. office deduction. Yeah, the home office deduction can only be uh, by people that do uh, that are sole proprietors. Otherwise, that uh, that file a Schedule C along with right. their 40, you know, whether they're a single member LLC or just a sole proprietor. Uh, anything beyond that cannot. The IRS just says, no, you can't. Because here's, here's, the, here's the weird logic about it. If you own yeah. an S corporation, and you were to try to take the home office deduction. Well, they ask uh, corporations a separate entity. So for them to do home office deduction, they would have to rent it from you, the space from you. The corporation would have to rent mm -hmm. the space from you. Well, that would make you a landlord. So then you'd have to file a Schedule E to claim that income that the corporation is paying you and take the deductions against that. And so one washes the other, and the IRS says, no, no, we're not going to mm. pay and so mm. you just can't do it. So, you know, you have restrictions like that also. But what about a C-Corp? Now, a C-Corp is a totally different thing. And I run my business under a C-Corporation. Mm -hmm. A C-Corporation is a totally separate entity from um, the uh, taxpayer. It's just like IBM or Microsoft mm -hmm. or anything else. You mm -hmm. own shares in the company. They pay their own taxes, um, you know, their own expenses and everything else. It's a totally separate thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, there's other benefits and things. There's more overhead, but there's also some other benefits uh, that you can give yourself uh, when you get into benefits and 401s and, and, and um, so forth and so on uh, that, that you can do that you can't do with the others, you see. Because the, the C Corporation is the only legal entity that actually pays its own taxes. Everything else, partnerships, as corporations, and sole proprietorships, uh, all pay their taxes on your personal tax return. It all flows mm -hmm. down to your personal tax return. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you really want to put up a wall, yeah, you can do a C corporation, and, and that mm -hmm. does do that. And have the, that doesn't help your W-2 any, but as far as if you're running your own business, definitely you can do that. Now, at the current rate, sometimes it's more advantageous because the current rate for C-corporations is 21%. used to be in the 30s, and who mm. knows what it's going to be in two years. But um, I, and, and on your personal return, you may be paying uh, 24 to 30% if you make $150,000 to $200,000 a year. So that may not be ad advantageous in the, current, mm. in the current situation. So these are all the things that a good tax repair is going to be able to sit down and talk to you and advise mm -hmm. you. you know. mm -hmm. um, I, I just have one more question about that. So if I 
go to look for property in another state and I fly there. Uh, I stay in the Airbnb for the weekend um, and I bring a couple of people from my team. Am I able to write off the airfare, the uh, Airbnb, and maybe even some of the meals from when we're out of town? As long as it has a business purpose, yes. Yeah, because we're looking yeah. at properties to invest in. Right. Right. So, and that's under a separate company from UW2. So, yes. 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 And, yeah, that's all. That's all for business purpose. Now, if you were to take seven days and four of it would be uh, for personal and three for business, then you would just prorate it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, you hear a lot of things. And while I got you here, I just want to make sure that. The things I'm hearing, some of them are not true. Some of them are true. So I'm just running it by you. So let's talk about how you help educate businesses because I, I think that's, that's, you know, interesting. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a need. There's a real need in the marketplace that people get involved in business. They start doing things and, um, they maybe don't know how to set up the business entity and maybe they're getting the wrong advice from some people. Cause I mean, when I, when I hear people talking about business entities, for some reason, a lot of people just like to say, open an LLC, open an LLC, open an LLC. And I'm like, why, why, why LLC? Like, how do, how does that help you in this specific situation? Um, and so the education that you provide to really look at what's the pros and cons of the different business entities when you start them and how that's going to you know, affect you as a business in the future. I think that's really important. Tell me a little bit about the education that you offer small to medium sized businesses. Oh, let me start with the LLC thing, because that is one of the most biggest misconceptions there is in the entire business world. Mm -hmm. uh, an LLC, a lot of people think is a corporation. It's not. It stands for limited liability company. And mm -hmm. they came up, it's, it's not recognized at the federal level. It's only mm -hmm. recognized at the state level. And every, all 50 states now have one. It took 10 years for all 50 states to pass that. And they mm. all work a little bit differently. Mm. All it does is give you, because prior to LLCs, sole proprietorships and general partnerships had no liability protection whatsoever. Mm. Uh, if somebody sued the company, they could attach your personal assets. Right. So all LLCs do is give you somewhat of the same personal liability protection that you would give if you opened a corporation. So mm -hmm. you don't have to go through that extra overhead. Single right. member LLCs at the federal level are considered sole proprietorships. Multi member LLCs at the state level at the federal level are considered partnerships. That's all that does. You know. So, so the LLC doesn't pay taxes. The individuals do. Correct. Who are the members? All that does is 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 add uh, instead of you having to uh, uh, buy a million dollar liability protection for your personal assets for owning a business, mm -hmm. it gives you that uh, you pay the state so much a year, depending on the state. In Florida, for instance, one hundred and thirty eight dollars and fifty cents a year they want, mm -hmm. and uh, you 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 add that layer of liability protection on top of your business. That's all it does. That's mm -hmm. all it does. And that's the biggest mis misconception out there because people think, oh, I'm opening a corporation. Well, no, you're not. You're just adding mm -hmm. liability to your mm -hmm. existing business is all mm -hmm. you're doing. So what I did, I mean, I've been teaching people uh, all this stuff at the tax gas for, well, I just finished my 22nd year that I've done it now, which is incredible to me. I, I, I started as a part-time job 22 years ago until I wanted mm -hmm. to figure out what I wanted to do. And uh, here I am. So, a couple of years ago, I got to thinking, I would love, you know, it's just when you get into your 70s and like I am, you, you, you start looking back at life and you say, well, what does your life want to mean? And when it really comes down to it, I mean, it's not how much money that you've made in your life that counts mm -hmm. uh, in the end. It's how many people's lives you've improved. Mm -hmm. That's really, you know, and um it's not only good philosophy. I mean, it's a good Christian philosophy. That's what this country is built on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, it's a good way to live, I think. It gives you a lot of peace and a lot of satisfaction. Yes. So I said, I'm going to put all this knowledge into a course because online courses are really the thing nowadays mm -hmm. uh, for those that are willing to, to, to uh, 
to take the time to earn. And so I, I did, I did. It's got like seven hours worth of video and everything. It goes through all the different legal formats. It goes through all the mm. paperwork requirements, how you should keep your paperwork, how to put it together, because the better you put your paperwork together, the better the people that you hire can do their job for you. Mm. And then it goes through all of the tax consequences of all the legal formats and how all these three things tie together to work together to help you uh, build a solid foundation onto your business. This mm. is what they don't teach in school, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't teach marketing. I, I'm the last one you want to teach marketing to. I'm probably one of the worst people at marketing there is. But <laughs> when it comes to knowing how to put together a, a business and to properly structure it to give yourself a fighting chance, because, I mean, small business is the backbone of this country. We have to save it, and we have to educate it, and we have to, to make mm -hmm. it solid. And so I put this together, and I've put it out there. People can take it. This is basically a college-level course, you mm -hmm. know. But I've not only done that. I mean, I have a lot of free information on my website. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel that teaches some of this basic basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the paid course is the college-level course. It's the stuff mm -hmm. they should be teaching in college. Mm -hmm. They should be teaching in school, but they aren't. And it comes in, and then I have other people that says, I don't have time. I'm not a study type person. I just want to sit down and I want to be able to talk to somebody and ask mm. all my questions. So I also added consulting services and tax mm. advisory services where mm -hmm. people can just get on a Zoom call with me and we sit down and we, and we talk it out and answer all their mm -hmm. questions and, and give them a, a starting basis where they can go, you know. Mm. I just out of curiosity, uh, you started to. You, what was, what was the shift for you when you did this? So, you know, you were you were just uh, doing. You were just working with businesses doing their taxes and, you know, advising them on their on their taxes and their business. Right, that's right. what you were doing before. And then you decided to create the courses to help educate people and impact more people's lives by giving them the foundational education they need to set up their business correctly and take the maximum write-offs that they can to keep more money in their pockets. What was that, what was that like? What was that like, that, that pivot there where you did I something that, completely I, I different? The pivot is, is when I hit 20 years in the business, I says, you know, at some point I'm going to have to retire. And, um, mm. and so I want I want to be able to pass it along, you know, when that yeah. time comes. Uh, it's not come yet. I got a few more years in me, I think. But uh, when that time comes, I want to be able to have something put out there. I want to be able to say, okay, I'm not going to help you in this capacity, but I'm going to move over here into another capacity uh, where I can I can help work with people one on one, you know, and help yeah. them uh, achieve their dreams. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. What kind of challenges did you face with that? I mean, uh, setting up courses, making videos, you know, setting up the website, putting all that out there, figuring out how to get referrals and, you know, connect with people. I mean, it, it's like a brand new business that you basically opened up. It is. Uh, and you did it, you did it, you know, you know, in your late 60s or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yes. I mean, uh, most yeah. people, most people, you know, they think their lives are over. <laughs> you know, when they when they hit sixty, they figure I'm I'm done. You know, um, what what was going on that you were willing to take that challenge on and and push through and 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 whatnot? Well, I, you know, I'm not the rock and chair type. I'm just not. Uh, th there's two things in life. I, I also discovered you know, and examining life is there's just two things in my life that I, that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Number one is education because I was an education major in college. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, I went and did student teaching and said, uh, I get fired every year. I can't, I can't teach for this government school system mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, they don't allow you to teach. You know? Yeah. Uh, this is back in early seven, in the early seventies. And they had the new math where two plus two equal five. And, and uh, they threw out phonics, and I said, this is ridiculous. And school boards were dictating what books you could teach from, and you can't teach mm. from anything but that. And I'm going, mm. these people are nuts, which they were. Um, mm. I went, so I've taught in the business world most of my life, um, mm -hmm. that or an individual. So, But that, and the other thing I really love is creativity. I love designing, you know. I've done mm. a lot of designing. Uh, I've owned um, 
uh, design firms, uh, landscape design firms, um, uh, web design firms. Uh, I just love creating things, you know. And so I had a background in computers since, well, I got into them in 89 before mm. Windows was even a thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and so and I've been web design and and their and education and everything. So I had to learn how to videotape. That was the biggest challenge: how to mm-hmm. video, how to write scripts and videotape. The mm-hmm. scripts weren't so bad, but the videotaping that and, and editing that that's yeah, a, being an on camera, yeah, being an on camera uh, spokesperson, yeah. So that was the biggest challenge there. But I'm pretty proud of what I put together. My biggest problem is I'm lousy at marketing. <laughs> I'm just lousy at marketing. I'll admit it. And and people don't see the need uh, hmm. and, and, until they've lost a bunch of money, unfortunately. Hmm. And uh, and I had a lot of people. You know, I go to to different business meetings and things. And they say, "Oh well, I'll just I just I'll just you know that's why I went and hired a CPA. Take care mm-hmm. of all that thing. I don't need mm-hmm. to learn it." Because, mm-hmm. you know, I'll just hire somebody else to take care of it for me and I don't mm-hmm. have to think about it. And Unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, in every profession, there's good and bad. And yeah. unless you know the subject yourself, um, you don't know that. You don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody, I hire somebody to come paint my house, uh, I know whether they've done a good job or not because I've done it myself. You mm. know, I learned it. You yeah. Know? So when I hire somebody, any tradesperson, I've usually done it. I hate plumbing. I hate plumbing. But when I hire a plumber, I know if they're doing it right or not, because mm-hmm. I've done it mm-hmm. out of necessity mostly during my life. But I've done it, and it's the same way with business. If you're going to run a business, learn the business of business, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. whatever you want to do, sit that on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think it's very valuable, and and I and I think it's great. I mean. Um, you're you're a young man, really. Uh, today, uh, you know, I, I think things are different today. We live much longer. Uh, we are, have been now educated enough to live a more healthy, vibrant life. Most of us. Um, so, so I think there's lots of opportunity for you to to keep going uh, before you throw in the towel. Maybe even create another business. It could happen. <laughs> it could happen. It I could never happen. I never count anything out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. but I think it's great that you did that and uh, you know took the opportunity to put all that information that was in your head and from your 20 years of experience put it in a form that somebody else could learn and understand everything so that they can get a leg up instead of going out there and having to spend the next couple of years making terrible mistakes before they then go find the information, hopefully to help them. Correct. Uh, so, so I think that's, I think that's really great. Um, and then when you do the consulting, um, is there different uh, specific trades that you're involved in or you, you work with all kinds of companies? I work with all kinds of companies. I mean, mm-hmm. the course itself comes with consulting, but for mm-hmm. people that uh, I have, I have options for people that want that, just that, you mm-hmm. know, Mm-hmm. And um, the other day I was on somebody that was in Italy because they had, it was an American citizen moved over there and wanted to start a little mm-hmm. business over there and, and didn't know how to do it, you know. So you, you never know what you're going to come across. It makes it very interesting. It really does. Yeah. So, but I built a, a corporate website uh, that I, I finally had to redo my corporate website because I had all these things going on to where it just one website links to everything. You know, rather than mm-hmm. me giving out three different uh, website addresses and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I have I have your info, so I'll drop it in the show notes to direct people to your website and your course, um, so that they could take advantage of that. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So, Roger, um, tell me a little bit about. You know, you're doing this thing and you're making an impact and you're leaving a legacy. Tell me a little bit about what what is that what does that feel like for you working with these customers and and getting making an impact for them and helping them to you know better themselves in a way and you know put more money in their pocket, make their business a, a better structure. What is that like for you? Oh, that's that's you know a lot of people <clears throat> a lot of people say. Well, you know, taxes are just numbers, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and I tell people, well, I couldn't think of anything more boring in my life than being an accountant, 
Mm -hmm. No offense to the accountants out there, because if you like it, good for you. But Mm -hmm. uh, me, to me, it's uh, taxes. It's like me against the IRS. It says, how do I use the IRS rules to benefit my clients? Right. And this is what the big corporations do. This is why you hear, well, this corporation didn't pay, they, they didn't hardly pay any taxes, whatever. Exactly. Yeah, they're using the tax laws in, for the benefit of their clients. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, if you're buying equipment, do you write it off this year? Do you write it off over several years? Do you use depreciation? Do you use Section 179? How do you structure this to correspond with your projected income for that particular year to get the maximum deductions to reduce your taxability. Mm. All these things are fun. But here's, for instance, let me give you a story. Uh, Two years ago, I had uh, a lady come to me. She had just, she had started a new business as a a home cook, a home chef. Mm -hmm. And she was very successful. The first year she Mm. made $100,000 net profit. Hmm. And I told her what she was going to, as a Schedule C, what she was going to owe. And she was, you know, with all the W-2s and everything else in the house, it was a six over $6,000 in taxes. I hmm. said, no, you came to me early enough of the year that I can, I can do something about this. Mm-hmm. So I had got her restructured into an S corporation uh, and uh, restructured everything. The, the end result was instead of owing $6,000, she got a $2,500 refund. <laughs> uh, that's good because i taught her here's what and she listened because she listened to me i have people that don't listen to me and i have stories right. about that too but, uh she listened to me we did it uh i knew all the loopholes and the laws to make this happen and uh, not loopholes advantages of the law to make this happen mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh and it was able to do it for her and uh, she was very, very happy client at that point. Yes, yes. But there's only – not every tax pro would know how to do that. Not every tax professional mm-hmm. knows how to do that type of thing. It has to or would even take the time. Or would even take the time, exactly, yeah. or even cares, because a lot of yeah. them are just like accountants or CPAs that are paper pushers. Oh, mm-hmm. Next, 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 next. Um, mm-hmm. I, I sometimes get a lot of grief because I'm told, will you take too much time with the clients? I says, no, I take the time and necessary with the clients right. to do the best job for them I can do. And yeah. uh, if if the day I stop doing that, this is the day I should retire from what I'm doing. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. But I have lots of stories like that. That's what I get off on, being able yeah. to do things like that for people. So I know one of the interesting things is uh, this relationship when you find somebody who is a tax professional and an enrolled agent uh, so that you can maximize your deductions and everything. How often do you meet with this person and communicate with them? Well, you should meet more than once. You should meet no less than twice a year. Usually you'll meet uh, during tax season. I always recommend in February, by the end of February, always uh, mm-hmm. If you're running a business, and then again in October, November time frame, because you need to really look over what's happened during the year at that point and project what's going to the next year to see if you need to make any changes before mm-hmm. the end of the year that would impact anything going into the next year. So, and there are some people. In, would you get into larger businesses? You know, when mm-hmm. you get into the, the half million to million dollar businesses, then you probably want to have a look quarterly. You really do. But a smaller business, I'd say twice. You know, I have a lot of people, Mm -hmm. the only time they, they, you know, they'll touch base with me. Uh, Sometimes it's just a phone call where, you know, they they tell Mm -hmm. we pick up the phone, we talk about where we're at and things like that towards the end of the year. Uh, cause they, they're thinking of doing some things the next year. They want mm-hmm. my opinion on how it would affect them, you know, things like that. But that's the type of relationship that you should really have. It's just not somebody that, uh, um, uh, and it's not that I work in the tax office all year. I only work in the tax office most, mostly during the tax season, but mm-hmm. for my small business clients, they, they all have my phone number. And mm-hmm. so a lot of them, you know, they will pick up the phone and call me or text me or something the rest of the year. And that's fine also. Yeah. What are some of the big mistakes that you see uh, people making when they're starting a business? The biggest mistake people make when not starting a business is paperwork. They don't keep track of their paperwork. They have no system, you know. Mm. I have had people come in that uh, they're – 
uh, accounting system is their checkbook, their mm. bank statements, and that doesn't that's that's doesn't work. And ha- and then especially if you're commingling it with your personal funds, mm. I mean that's the that is the oh, worst yeah. mistake that you can possibly make. I mm. had one gentleman he had he gotten into sales. And uh, it was on a 1099. He was selling. He was selling energy contracts between energy companies. Mm-hmm. Just was very good at it. He made a quarter million dollars the first year mm-hmm. on a Schedule C. And he came in. He didn't keep track of anything. He just mm. put it all in his personal bank account and wrote money out of that. Wow. And I tried to, tried to reconstruct as much as I could. And I said, "You're going to be audited on this. Mm-hmm. You need to be. This kind of money has to go through a corporation." You can't be doing this, what you're doing. Right. You need to do this and this and this, and this is how you need to keep paperwork, this and this and this. And he came back to me the second year. And the only thing he'd done is open a business checking account. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I said, you're going to be No business out. entity? No. Schedule C. That's weird. Yeah. He didn't listen to a word I said, except open a separate business account. And mm-hmm. he was audited for that. Those two years that he was audited, I told him he was going to be. And... Uh, after that, he listened to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he went out and he restructured his corporation and everything. He, he, mm-hmm. he, um, he hired a accountant. And, uh, and uh, I had actually, he learned well enough uh, from what I had taught him in those three years that he actually opened another uh, S corporation and another business. So, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and I don't, and I lost him as a client because of that, but because, you know, he's just having everybody take, but that's all right. I have the satisfaction of knowing that I took somebody that knew nothing, and three years later, uh, even though it cost him a costly lesson because he wouldn't listen to me, um, here he owns two corporations and is, is very, very successful with them. Mm. So that's satisfaction, too. That, that's why I do these things, you know. So when he opened up the second business, he now had the foundational education so that he did it better from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He started mm-hmm. it right. You know, yeah. and so yeah, it was glad to see. I was glad to see that. Yeah. So um, I've I've really enjoyed our time together. Uh, I thank you for helping me answer some questions of my own and better ways to do things. Um, I'm going to drop the information so people can get in touch with you because I think uh, or and anybody, especially people who are looking to break away from their nine to five and start some kind of side hustle to turn that into an opportunity so they could leave their full time job. Uh, needs to get some education and understanding about all these things so they could set it up correctly from the beginning instead of doing what the other guy did and, you know, having to pay the price for two years, uh, you know, before they fix everything. It really, it really, you know, I think it pays. I think it pays. Yeah. Education always pays. It always yeah, pays absolutely. many times over the cost of it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Roger. Thanks for coming on, and I will be back in touch with you. Thank you very much. It was a good conversation. Yes, sir. For more information and monthly topics of interest, please go to transformyourfuture.com and join our newsletter.